around 100 years ago, uh, Charles Schwab, Schwab, president of Bethlehem Steel, big company in the U.S., wanted to increase his own efficiency and, on the, and of the management team at the steel company. So he brought in a guy named I.V. Lee, a well-known efficiency expert, a time management expert. He approached Mr. Schwab, Schwab and he, asked, he made a proposition that, to Charles Schwab that, could, that he could not refuse. Ivy simply said this, I can increase your people's efficiency and your sales if you allow me to spend 15 minutes with each of your executives. Schwab, Schwab asked, how much will it cost me? Lee replied, nothing, unless it works. After three months, you can send me a check for whatever you feel is worth, it's worth to you. So Schwab, Charles Schwab said, it's a deal, you've got a deal. So the following day, Ivy Lee met with Schwab's Bethlehem Steel's all his executive and management team, but he actually only spent 10 minutes with, with them in order to tell them this simple thing. He said to them, I want, to make, I want you to promise me that for the next 90 days, three months basically, before leaving your office at the end of the day, you will make a list of six of the six most important things you have to do the next day and number them from the, in the order, to, order of importance from one to six. The astonished executives asked, that's it? He said, yeah, that's it. Just do the number one important thing first. Then when you finish it, you scratch it off and then go on to the next one on your list. If something doesn't get done, put it on the following day's list. So each Bethlehem Steel executive consented to follow Lee's instructions. After three months, Schwab studied the results and he was so pleased that he sent Lee a check for $25,000. That's why it was worth to him. And, and you get it for free this morning. We're continuing our series this morning on fasting and prayer. And this morning's message, I've titled it Fasting and Focus, based on Ephesians 6. Because focus is so important. Fasting helps us to put prayer and the issues that we want to pray about in number one priority. It puts it on our number one list of things to do. That's what fasting helps us do. That's why it's so important. It makes that prayer issue job number one. You know, by the way, we, I, I, I'm using the words fasting and prayer almost synonymous, right? Remember I talked about two weeks ago, I think a few weeks ago I mentioned in, in, in Ezra chapter 8, verse 23, uh, Ezra says, then we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. So fasting and prayer almost synonymous in that way in the scriptures. You're fasting, you're praying. So what happens when you fast, you focus. That's why I titled the sermon, Fasting and Focus. Now I'm not saying, by the way, that we are to be, live an unbalanced life and not to enjoy life. You never eat again, right? But that, there, there are seasons, though, when you fast. There are seasons when we need to fast to focus on a certain issue in our lives. And then you fast. And what, so here's how it works. When you start fasting, how does fasting work? See, when you're, you're starting to fast, okay? And you, and you, and you, you, you hear some, some, some amazing, mind-boggling, stupendous sermon on fasting on Sunday morning in February. And then all of a sudden, you go, I'm going to go home. I'm going to start fasting about this one issue, a, a, a relationship or a job or, or uh, my, my school or something and, and, or my, my walk with the Lord. And, and you start thinking about But then you get home and the Super Bowl's on and you got to make your guacamole or whatever. And, and, and then the next thing you know, it's, oh, I forgot to pray for that. The next day, you wake up in the morning, you go, oh, I remember I had a sermon yesterday and, and I've got to start fasting about that one issue. And then you got to go to work, and you and you have the computer in front of you. You have a client or your patient in front of you, or you've got your teacher, your professor, and she's and she's giving some lecture, and you got to focus on that. And the next thing you know, it's the end of the day, and you hadn't prayed about it once. And so the next morning you say, I got to I got to start praying about this issue. But if you start fasting, what happens is that during breakfast you, you go to make your cereal? Oh, I'm fasting. Lunchtime. Your stomach starts grog, you know, kicking you from the inside out, right? And your stomach's telling you, hey, feed me, feed me. And you're like a little kid, you know. And, but you go, to, you go to grab a sandwich at the store or whatever and down at the cafeteria. And then you realize, hold it, I'm fasting. Why am I fasting? Why am I torturing myself? Oh, yeah, I have to pray about that one issue. 
and then it's three o'clock in the afternoon, and you, and you go to grab some, some, some cookies with your coffee, and you realize, hold, hold it, no cookies today. I'm, why am I fasting? Oh, yeah, I have to pray about that issue. And throughout the day, and every time you go by, you, you watch TV, and you see a commercial on, on food, and you, why am I mad? Oh, because I can't eat. Why? Because I'm fasting, because of that one issue. That's how it works. It helps you focus on that one issue. And you start praying about that one issue. That's how it works. So fasting, not only is it in general when you want to grow closer to the Lord, but oftentimes it's for that one specific issue. I know every one of you has that specific issue in your life. You've got something or someone or some issue that you want to pray about that doesn't come out. That's, it's, it's, a, it's something that's, it's, it's that stain, it's that, that uh, blackened dot in your bottom of your pot of your life that you've got to scrub away with prayer and you need to fast over that issue you need to fast over that issue whatever it is sometimes it's big sometimes it's, it's for some others other people might think it's small but for you it's big and you want to fast over that issue and so that's why i want to look at the, our, our text this, this morning oh by the way i want to mention also before i go into that our text there are different types of fasting okay for some of you it's food for some of you fasting is food okay uh, for others it might be TV. You watch TV every night. You've got your favorite show, but you stop fast. You stop watching that show because you want to focus on prayer that day. Others, it's video games. Okay. <laughs> you can you can live without video games. You will not die. You will not. actually, if you end up playing too many video games, I heard like three guys last 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 month in Taiwan have died playing video games three or four four or five days at a time. Right. They literally died. Um, uh, it wasn't because it was a bad video game, because it was too good, right? And so you can live without video games. And you ask, so why, am I, why am I have so much time on my hand? I'm fasting. News, hobbies, even physical intimacy with your spouse. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5. Do not deprive each other, meaning of physical intimacy with your spouse, except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Okay? So there might be other issues. So, so, if, so if you have a health issue, you have to eat, uh, uh, you know, whatever, a uh, certain amount of food, make it something else. But you want to focus, get rid of any distractions in your life. And that's why this morning I want to talk about a text that talks about prayer. The importance, that w what prayer is all about, because that's what you're going to do when you're fasting, okay? By the way, Speaking of distractions, I don't know what that is in the background, okay? I, I, I don't know what, okay? So the, you can't hear it on the radio or whatever in the, the video, but I hope no one's dying in our congregation. Okay, okay so it's just, let's just ignore that. Uh, the background, you open your Bibles to Ephesians. And in Ephesians, I, I just want to give you some, some context to our, to our text this morning. The old saying is you don't have the context, you have a pretext, right? And so Ephesians, one of the, it's one of the prison epistles of Paul, written while in prison in Rome in early 60s, uh, AD 60. Com companion book to Colossians, very similar. A cyclical letter to be circulated to many churches in the area, called the crowning jewel or capstone of Paul's theology. All the great themes of Paul are in this text, are in, in Ephesians. It emphasizes the unity of all things in Christ, who is Lord of all things. And our passage this morning starts off with talking about, so I'm going to give a little background to our text, which we're going to focus on the last few verses. Uh, the, the first few verses is chapter 6, verses 10 to 13, spiritual warfare and truth. So as before we talk about prayer, we, we recognize there is spiritual warfare, and, sorry, spiritual warfare, verses 10 to 13. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against this devil's schemes. The, so what this tells us is that we are at war as Christians. You may not think it, but we are at war. Let me quote uh, Stephen Harper okay, this week. He said, you know, he said that we're, we're at war with terrorism. And it kind of, it's kind of similar in the sense that we, I mean, Canada is not in, in, a, in a physical combat war with, with, with uh, the enemy. We're not in that sense war. But... As Harper mentioned, we are in some kind of a war, an insidious enemy in the background who would kill us if they could. We are at war as Christians. There is someone that would kill you if he could. Okay? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Our war is not against flesh and blood. It's against supernatural evil powers. So we fight with supernatural weapons. Now, I don't want us to get spooky and all mystical here, okay? I, I don't want you to start thinking, okay, like, like the Force, Star Wars, you know? We, we have to have develop some kind of supernatural power, like, you know, to, like, like the Avengers or Fantastic Four or something, right? That's not the kind of spiritual we're talking about. We actually deal with very physical things. Someone's attacking you uh, in the flesh, in, in this world. Someone's yelling and screaming at you at work, at school, bullying you. Someone's doing something against you. Someone's stabbing you in the back, metaphorically speaking, at work. Someone's being cruel to you. That's a, a real thing, a flesh and blood thing. Someone's, in a sense, his blood or her blood is boiling out against you. Something's hindering you in the background. You, you, it's a flesh and blood thing. Some, someone's stopping you from getting things done in the spirit uh, that is good. What Paul says in this text is, it's not just a physical thing you can see, but there's a spiritual thing behind it. It's more insidious. It's deeper. It's bigger. It's more terrible. It's more sinister. It's more destructive than meets the eye. It's like, it's like you know, like an um, iceberg. There's more underneath than there is on the surface. And so we fight this battle with spiritual weapons, and he mentions it in the next few, few verses. I, I preached on this last year a sermon called uh, uh, on, on spiritual warfare, and so I'm not going to go in depth. But I want to just bring out one thing about these weapons of the warfare. They all deal with some aspect of relationship to truth. Okay? So we fight our spiritual battle, battles with the, spirit, with the weapon of truth. Belt of truth. First section, first, first weapon. Objective truth of the Bible. The belt of truth, tr or truthfulness. Breastplate of righteousness. Becoming a righteous person by living by the truth. Feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. A peace that comes from the truth of Jesus. Shield of faith. Faith in what? Faith in the truth that has been given to us in the word of God. Helmet of salvation. We love and cherish the truth of our salvation. And finally, the sword of truth. The word of God. We fight with truth. That is our weapon against the enemy. That's our spiritual weapon. So when you have something going on against you, someone say someone's calling you an idiot or something or a uh, uh, turkey or, you know, and, 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 and you're being insulted and you fight it with the truth that you're not, that you are the child of God. And you start listening to God's word rather than yourself. That's why most people get into depression, by the way, because you're listening to yourself more than you listen to God. That's why you're depressed. Or many people are depressed. Okay? Stop listening to yourself. Listen to God, the truth. That's how we fight this battle, okay? The spiritual battle. That's how we, and then with truth, we have the weapon of prayer. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. I didn't do it last time when I preached, so I want to focus. Verses 18 and 20, prayer. What we're, fast, what, what we're doing when we're fasting, pray. Verse 18 and 20, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So first, first point, pray for all. Okay, that, what do I mean? Pray for all. Pray for all. Pray in the Spirit. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Does that mean speaking in tongues? Is that praying in the Spirit? No, no. That's not the context of this text this morning, praying in tongues. Okay? In the Spirit as opposed to in the flesh. When you're praying in the flesh, you're praying by your, through yourself, worldly, self-centered, physical, vain repetition. We are not of the faith that says you've got to repeat these Hail Marys to get God to answer you. Or that you have to touch these prayer beads and go through the list of prayer beads because if, if you can pray so many prayers according to the beads, then God will answer you. That's praying in the flesh. We are to pray in the Spirit and through the Spirit. Pastor Kwan mentioned this a few weeks back. Do you remember he talked about how do we know, he talked about in James, it says that we know our prayers are answered. How do we know our prayers are answered? When we pray according to the Spirit. Because the Spirit's prayer is always answered. 
Romans 8, 26, 27. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray, but, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through word, wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Pray in the Spirit. Align yourself with the will of God every morning. I, I saw my, my spiritual mentor this week, Steve Chu. I haven't seen him for a while now. And he just reminded me, when I get up in the mornings, you know, we have a million and one things that you can do every single morning. And so confusing. What do I do, Lord? The first thing in the morning, you ask God, God, what's your will for me? What's your will for me? Pray in the Spirit. And then throughout the day, Ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? This week, I, I had my whole week planned out, and God just turned it around. Someone asked me to visit, go to Hamilton. I spent the whole day in Hamilton one day, but it was according to the will of God. It's the best thing I could have done that day. But I, I didn't know it was coming up, but I was listening to God's voice. I didn't hear a physical voice, but I had that spirit compelling me, go to Hamilton, deal with that issue. Listen to the spirit. Listen to the spirit so crucial. Pray in the Spirit. Okay? And then pray in every situation, on all occasions, verse 18. Every circumstance, uh, Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Everywhere, whether you're at home, at school, in the car, on your bed, at a meal, on the field, in the arena, at the courtroom, in the, in the operating table, it's not, prayer is not just in our buildings, church building. Prayer is everywhere. I pray with my son every, every morning on the way to school. Okay? I keep my eyes open, by the way. <laughs> I'm not that, uh, you know, yeah. Not, the old saying is so heavenly minded, you're earthly useless. No, I keep my eyes open. But the fact is, you can pray in the car. My, did I mention, I think I mentioned many years ago when I first came here. Uh, when, I, when I was in seminary, I, I lived in a small little room with three other uh, three guys together, and there's no there's no privacy in seminary in, in the in the in the, um, uh, the dorm rooms. And the only place I can find was 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 the bathroom. That's where I prayed. <laughs> was was the bathroom, right? And so go because it has a locked door and all that stuff, right? And, and so that's what you do. And, and, there's, and there's a seat handy, right? <laughs> and so you pray anywhere you have to. And, you know, and, and do you realize what a privilege that is to touch? the heart of the eternal God of heaven anywhere, everywhere, in any situation. You know, how hard would it be for you to meet some person like the Queen of England or President Obama or, or, or whatever? How, hard would, how, how long would it take for you to set up an appointment with them? But the Bible says anywhere we can meet and, and, and hold the hand of him who moves the universe. It's an, we don't have to crawl on our hands and knees over broken glass like some religions to go and sacrifice a goat to have him to have their deity pray, uh, listen to your prayers. We just pray. What a privilege! What an honor! Every situation, on all occasions, it's one of the I think one of the greatest verses in the Bible. You're in the middle of your exam. Pray. Well, actually, I know you do that. <laughs> That's the one place everyone prays, right? New exam. Uh, at a banquet, a wedding banquet, pray. When you're hurt in a hospital, pray. When you're confused and you're not sure, pray. When you're angry, upset about something, pray. Every situation, in any style, Verse 18, with all kinds of prayers and requests, different varieties. You're, you're, you can speak when you're praying. You can sing when you're praying. You can meditate when you're praying. You know, some people say that you have to pray out loud. No, you can pray in your heart. You can do it, you can do it with any kind of language. It behooves thee to beseech the divine with more than just flowery language. It took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> In other words, you don't have to use old King James English, okay? <laughs> you can use any old language. Just pray. Just pray with your own. So many people, when I ask them to pray out loud, oh, oh Reverend Ted, I can't pray out loud. No, no, you can You can pray. You can pray out loud. Because God doesn't need fancy language. Actually, it's a little baby language that often, you know, I, I, I like it when, 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 when you know, older people give me fancy 
conversation, but I, what's the best conversation when my, my sons were little? And they said, Papa, right? They wouldn't even say it properly, right? But they, they would say it. And that was the most precious language to me. That's what I'm, I, I was just telling Pastor Patrick, who's now Reverend Patrick, you know, I, you're honored as a reverend. All that. But I said, when I get, became reverend, my sons call me Greverend for some reason. I, but I, I cherish that. I remember that. Yeah, that's what they call me. It's the pet name. It's use whatever language. Just speak it out. Any style. And, and then you pray. Oh, any, and by the way, any, any physical manner, the most common form of prayer is prostration the, in, the, in the Greek. The idea is you prostrate. So most common prayer is flat on your face. Pray on your knees. Pray flat on your face. Pray on your back. Pray kneeling. Uh, pray with your arms out. Pray with your arms in. Pray with your eyes open. Pray with your eyes closed. Pray verbal. Pray nonverbal. By the way, if you're wondering, uh, the devil cannot hear your thoughts, okay? <laughs> if you're wondering, so don't worry about that. Um, so don't worry about that. Okay, so pray in any style, any situation, in the spirit. Pray as a sentry. In other words, be alert. Prayer ought to be, the key thing with prayer is being, or well, one of the key things is being there and alert. And, and, and God has your attention. Because your intention is important. This afternoon, people are paying $4.5 million for 30 seconds of other people's attention okay, at the Super Bowl. $4.5 million. And thank you, by the way, I've got your attention for half an hour, right? That's a lot of money I owe you. <laughs> because it's so important to have your attention. They're willing to pay four and a half million dollars to get people to listen. God ought to have your attention. And you ought to be alert and all there when you're praying. Be alert. With this in mind, be alert. Watch and pray, Matthew 26, verse Verse 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Whatever you have to do, pay attention. If you have to walk around, that's what I do when I pray at the church, I walk around. Mark 13, 33, be on guard, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. Be on alert. Pray as a sentry, pray steadfast. Verse 18, always keep on praying. Always. First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually. Luke 11, verse 9. So I, so I say to you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Ask, seek, knock. Keep on knocking. Luke 18, 1. The parable of the persistent widow. Jesus told this, his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. You should be steadfast and persistent. And when you pray, have that single-mindedness to listen to God and to hear Him, to connect with Him. I was watching, uh, when I was in the hospital this week, uh, uh, for one of those days, I was, I was reading an old, old National Geographic. I was asking, you know, I said, Lord, you know, you know, you know I'm preaching this weekend. Um, uh, don't let me waste my time. As I was, I was just resting there, I was reading this. And the National Geographic, there's an article about uh, animal migrations. And they say that in, when animals migrate, it's very interesting. They have five characteristics. Prolonged movements outside the familiar, linear, direct, not zigzagging pathway, special behavior like overfeeding before they go. They demand special energy. And the main thing with animal migration, right in their DNA, is they maintain a fervent attentiveness to, greater, to the greater mission. They're undistracted by, by temptations and undeterred by challenges. Uh, scientists have studied the Arctic Turn, for example, which goes a long distance to Alaska every year and then, then back to its uh, other grounds. It flies almost a whole height, whatever you call it, the length of the Earth. And the Arctic turn, when it's on its migration, you, they have scientists who will get these juicy fish and they will hold it up to it and the Arctic terns will not eat the fish. They'll have the gulls and all these other animals who are not migrating dive for this fish and grab the fish off the scientists' hands. But these Arctic terns, even though they're starving and it's a tasty morsel, they know that they will be fed at the end and they will just keep on going until they get to that point. Undeterred. It's right, built right in their DNA. We are called at certain points in our life and we're praying. You just seek after God. And you keep on seeking until God answers. 
undeterred. It's, it, it, that's what Christians should be like, steadfast. And then you pray for all the saints, saints meaning Christians. Okay, 1 Samuel 12, verse 23. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. We to pray for everyone, especially for the saints, especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ. In the spirit, every situation, any style, as a century, steadfast for all the saints. Isaiah 56, verse 7. My house will be called the house of prayer for all nations. The characteristics of God people, of God's people, the church, we should be called a house of prayer. That ought to be our name. North Toronto House of Prayer. That should be what people think of us when they think of us. Hey, you want to come to my church at 88 Finch Avenue West, 9.45 a.m. in the morning, Sundays. Oh, I heard of NT. That's the people that pray. Not that's the people that play volleyball or play basketball. That's great. Or, or VBC. Or that, that's all great. But our characteristic should be that's the people that pray. The house of prayer. That ought to be our focus, our thought process all the time. I, I was, I was uh, looking up. Do you remember the movie Forrest Gump? Do you remember the movie Forrest Gump? A famous movie. Uh, remember that one character, his, name, his nickname was, was Bubba? Bubba. His real name was Benjamin Buford Blue. Okay? Uh, uh, the Bubba. He's a character in the movie, Forrest Gump. Forrest's best friend during Vietnam War. He enters the army. Okay, I won't tell you what happens to him. I'm just going to mention, okay? So don't groan yet. Okay, so, but Bubba, when he meets Forrest, his first question he asks him is, have you ever been on a shrimping boat? <laughs> And, and, and Forrest says no, and then he starts talking about shrimping. He talks about how his whole life he was a shrimper, and, and he, uh, he, he does shrimping, and his mom did shrimping, his, his mom's mom did shrimping, and his mom's mom did shrimping, right? And, and he said, all I want to do is go shrimping. Uh, when after the war, he wants to build a, a shrimping, uh, get a shrimping boat, get Forrest as a partner, and make money shrimping. All he talked about was how to, make shrimp, how, how to run a business in shrimping, how much money you can make, uh, what you can do with shrimp. You can barbecue it, broil it, bake it, saute it, shrimp kebab, shrimp creole, shrimp gumbo, pan, pan fry, deep fry, shrimp fry, sorry, stir fry, uh, pineapple shrimp, lemon shrimp, shrimp, uh, what's this, uh, coconut shrimp, pepper shrimp, shrimp soup, shrimp burger, shrimp sandwich, shrimp stew, shrimp salad, sh shrimp and potatoes. And he's, that's all he does when they're, when they're cleaning the floor, when they're changing their, 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 their guns. You know, at the end, he just simply says, I think that's it. <laughs> but you think shrimp, you think Bubba. Or you think Bubba, you think shrimp. When people think NTCBC, they ought to be thinking prayer. When they think you, when your coworkers think you, when your schoolmates think you, they ought to be thinking, that guy, that girl likes to pray. Man, how come all the time, whenever someone mentions a problem, he or she always says, I'll pray for you. Or whenever he's happy or she's happy, they say, God, just answer my prayer. Or, or how come I see him so qu quietly just sitting there before his meal, he's praying. Or how come, I, I, he take, he, how come he's, where has he gone the first 15 minutes of his lunch hour? He's off somewhere praying. And your wife sees you in the morning, you're quiet for 20, 30 minutes because you're praying. We ought to be a people of prayer. Pray always. Pray for all. Pray for all. I, I've got a few more minutes, so I just end off the last. Pray for ability. Pray for, pray for ability. Okay? Verse 19. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, my words may be given me. Paul doesn't ask for prayer for his leg his arm, his back, even though he went through all this pain. He was in the danger of, of Jews, danger of Gentiles, danger in the city. He was flogged, uh, how many times here? Five times he received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was pelted with stones. Three times he was shipwrecked. He spent a night and a day in the open seas. This was a man who had more pain than an F NFL player. Okay, this guy, Paul, was probably an aching one big wound. But he didn't ask for a prayer for that, okay? He did, he's not like most of our prayer meetings. It ends up being an organ recital, you know? Or, oh, let's pray for my arm, pray for my leg, pray for uh, whatever, right? No. 
he asked for this prayer. Pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me. Pray for that simple effectiveness of my witness. Famous preacher, they call him the Prince of Preachers, C.H. Spurgeon, famous Baptist, by the way. Uh, Sunday, January, 18, January 1850, it was snowing. He was not a preacher at the time. He was a rebellious teenager. But that Sunday, he couldn't go to his regular church, so he, it was snowing, uh, and so he's in England, right? So just like us, <laughs> in the cold, and he goes to the closest one he can see, and the closest church was a primitive Methodist chapel in Colchester, England. The regular preacher couldn't show up because he couldn't make it to the church either. There's a sparse crowd, only a few people in the audience, and so the only guy that preached was some deacon or something who was a shoemaker. And the only, he only had one, he could hardly read the guy, he wasn't very educated, but he had one text which was, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. And after five minutes, he ran out of things to say, because <laughs> he wasn't even a regular preacher. And so this shoemaker has this text, Look unto me, be ye saved all the ends of the earth. And so he just goes around the audience, and he, and he sees Spurgeon, and he goes, Young man, you look miserable. <laughs> and then he says, Look unto me. All, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. And he's quoting the verse. Look to Christ, he says. All the ends, and then that's all he says to, to Spurgeon. <laughs> so aren't you glad I didn't do that to you this morning? <laughs> but then here's a, me- Spurgeon's been hearing the gospel for many years. All these flowery messages. He ended up being a flowery speaker. Very eloquent. But he says that's where he was converted by this simple preacher just saying, look unto me, and he's saying, and then Spurgeon says, all of a sudden I realized, look, and I was looking to myself to save myself, and I need to look to Jesus to save me. And then a man was converted that, that changed Christendom. Pray for me, Paul says, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me. Pray for effectiveness. Pray for effectiveness. And finally, pray for audacity, pray for courage, so that when I will fiercely make known the mystery, the gospel, mystery meaning something that was before confusing or mysterious, now it's, it's open. For I am an ambassador, for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fiercely as I should. Pray for courage. Pray that I will be a true soldier of Jesus Christ. I'll give my all and I'll be courageous. There's this movie coming, that just came out, American Sniper. I haven't seen it yet, so don't worry. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. But I was looking it up on the internet. Now, who is this guy? Chris Kyle, right? And, in, and when I was listening to one of his interviews, and he simply says, as a soldier, every day you write this blank check to the government and just hope they don't cash it, but you're giving your all. I've never written a blank check, by the way. I saw a pastor do it on his ordination day to his father, who was also a pastor. He said, Dad, you know, I, I want to thank you. Dad and Mom, I want to thank you for raising me up. And he literally brought, he, he had a check, it was a blank check, and he, and he signed it, and he gave it to them. I'm thinking, you know, don't drop the check, right? <laughs> don't lose the check. Someone picks it up, they can write whatever, right? He gave a blank check. I don't know if you've ever done that to anyone in your life, but that's what you do as a Christian. You're saying to God, you've got my blank check. You've got my life, and, you, and, and, it's, and whatever my life is worth, you have it today. I'm your soldier. Take it from me if you want. Pray for courage. Pray that no matter what situation, you'll have no shame, no hesitation, and you'll be persistent. Ruth Gordon, uh, Belle Graham, sorry, wrote in the recent uh, issue, or it was re- reprinted, re- issued of the Decision magazine, she talked about a tribal war that was raging in Uganda. The soldiers were led, uh, led a, a line of prisoners to a bridge because they, they wanted to save, save money, uh, ha- the hassle. They would shoot the line of prisoners in this tribal war against this tribe that was against them. They'd line up the prisoners on the bridge, shoot them, and let them fall into the bridge to be eaten by the crocodiles so they, ha- they wouldn't have to bury them. Among these prisoners was a young Christian. And then, even though, <laughs> even though he was under the gun, Literally, he had the audacity and the courage to say, can I speak? Let me say something. And the, and the, and the, and the guard said, okay, okay, good, quick, make it quick. Then he simply said this calmly. He said this, I am a Christian. I'm not angry with you. For the same Jesus who I will see in a few seconds is the same Jesus who died that you might be saved. 
you just have to confess your sins. You just have to trust him as Lord. I forgive you. And may you accept his forgiveness as well. And that's it. They shot him. It fell into the water, eaten up. Turning to the next guy in line, the soldiers looked at him and they realized there's his tribal markings. They go, what are you doing here? You're not part of the tribe that we're fighting against. Get out of here. And so he was let free. But then it turns out he ended up becoming a Christian. And he became an evangelist and spent the rest of his life sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he watched a Christian die. He saw a Christian die. He saw the courage that a Christian had. In a sense, when you witness to someone at work, at school, you're thinking your reputation's dying. You might get fired. You might, no one else, everyone's going to laugh you. They're going to laugh you out of the classroom. They're gonna, all your relatives will laugh at you. Your, your, your whatever, your friends will laugh at you. The, your schoolmates, the guys at the, at the football team or the, the hockey team or the volleyball team, they're going to laugh at you. You're going to die inside. But if you can die with courage, if you witness to Jesus Christ, Paul says, pray that this is the way we live. Pray this is the way you live. The, the, the old saying is, you are immortal until your work is done. You're immortal until your work is done. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible privilege and honor to pray to you and to have you hear our prayers. We thank you for the incredible honor and privilege of fasting and focusing on what you want us to focus on. We, pray, we thank you for the incredible privilege and honor to be audacious and to be used by you, no matter how foolish our, 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 our style, no matter how feeble the way we speak, we know, Lord, you can use us for your glory. So we ask, Lord, use us this afternoon, use us tomorrow morning, use us every day of the, our, the rest of our lives. And Lord, help us to give you all praise and glory. Make this church, Lord, a, a church of prayer, we ask. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.